Welcome Age of Vintage Society. Today we will take a closer look at Ingrid Bergman's life and discuss how Ingrid Bergman was the pioneer of the women's rights in the 50s. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. From marital scandals to on-screen magnetism, a documentary about Ingrid Bergman salutes an actress who consistently defied expectations. It's hard now to imagine the kind of scandal Bergman caused when she became pregnant with Rossellini's child, while still married to her first husband, Petter Lindstrom. She wasn't just a wife, she was a mother, and had left her daughter Pia behind when she went off to Italy to work with Rossellini. The outrage was scalding. Bergman News jolts Hollywood like an A-bomb, screeched one newspaper headline, neatly combining two of the most important news items of 1949. Rossellini apparently won that bet, because even before filming, the two were flirting in the way that people do when they know, against the rules sex, is in their immediate future. In the US, religious groups began a campaign to ban her films on the grounds that they were glorified adultery. In Italy, she and Rossellini were followed everywhere by the paparazzi, their companions for the rest of their tumultuous life together. I was a danger for American womanhood. Even my voice over the radio was supposed to be dangerous. Of course I was hurt, but I didn't think that what I'd done was so much other people's business. If you don't like the performance, you can walk out, but to criticise people's private life, I thought was wrong. But once the affair started in earnest on set in Italy, complete with photos of them holding hands, the shit hit the gossip-mongering fan. Bergman denied rumours of pregnancy to gossip columnist moralising old biddy Hedda Hopper, even though she was at least three months along. And so when Hopper's arch-rival Luella Parsons announced the pregnancy days later, Hopper retaliated by mean-girling and slut-shaming Bergman as thoroughly and frequently as possible. Ed Sullivan refused to allow Bergman on his show, and she was denounced on the floor of the United States Senate as an instrument of evil. Bergman's husband refused to grant her a quick divorce, effectively ensuring that Bergman would give birth to an Italian love affair. Of course, Bergman's virginal image didn't mix well with an affair. But here's the thing, this was the early 50s, and morals and understandings of how a woman should behave were changing. That defiant statement of intent is quoted in Ingrid Bergman, in her own words a new documentary film directed by Stig Bjorkman that tells the story of one of Hollywood's most enduring stars. It draws on her diaries, letters and interviews, interspersed with home movies, and glimpses of the actress in all her screen glory, from her Swedish debut in 1935 to her Hollywood heyday in the 1940s, to her final roles nearly 40 years later. It is a revealing insight into a woman who consistently defied expectations. In her first American screen test, in bleached out colour and silence, with no makeup, as the clapperboard proclaims, she shines. It is as if she is in possession of a secret, and that knowledge illuminates her from the inside as she glances directly at the camera or smiles with a warmth that could thaw a Swedish winter. It's a sign of all that is to come. If you think of Bergman on screen, in Casablanca, Notorious or Gaslight, it is that radiance that first comes to mind. In part, this was a simple matter of her beauty. Daniel Selznick, son of the powerful David O. Selznick, who first swept Bergman away to Hollywood, told her biographer Charlotte Chandler, 
There is no one I have ever met of any age of any generation that took one's breath away at every meeting the way she did. The complexion, the lips, the cheeks, the ears, the nose, the eyes, the body of a goddess. And she was just completely unself-conscious. Gregory Peck, her co-star in Hitchcock's Spellbound, suggested that she was even more beautiful away from the studio cameras, a judgment vindicated by the home movie footage that shows her relaxed with family and friends. But there is some other mysterious force at work. From the very first she was confident in front of a camera, and it is Pia Lindstrom, the daughter she abandoned when she ran off with Rossellini, who offers a psychological explanation for her mother's dazzling impact on screen. Bergman's mother had died when she was two, so she was brought up by her father, a photographer, whom she adored, until he too died when she was thirteen. Bergman was a dab hand behind a camera too, inheriting from her father a desire to record the world. Love would come right through that lens, suggests Lindstrom. She was looking through that lens, and she is looking at her dear dead father, and she would flirt and play with him and pose with him. She was completely comfortable with the camera and knew how to pose. Bergman herself was aware of her gift. She was a poor little orphan girl, lonely and bereft, yet filming made her feel alive. There's a photograph of her going to her first ever job as an extra that is notable not only for her staggering loveliness, but for the sheer vitality of her pose as she peers along the line of waiting hopefuls, looking outwards and forwards. I love the freedom I feel in front of the camera, she said. But she was a dab hand behind a camera too, inheriting from her father a desire to record the world and the people around her. She filmed her honeymoon with Petter, and when she left him suddenly, she wrote saying she didn't want many of the treasures she had left behind. The only problem will be our 16mm film. Maybe you will lend it to me so I can see what I looked like in my youth. That desire to preserve each aspect of her life in photographs and footage has left Bjorkman a wealth of material on which to draw. In this private footage you see her falling in love with Rossellini, stroking his head tenderly as they talk. You watch the three children they had together grow up. You see their fear as their parents' marriage falls apart. Later you watch the sadness cross Bergman's face as she climbs into an ambulance when her daughter, Isabella, is diagnosed with scoliosis. But just as revealing are the letters and diaries that Bergman also preserved, rich in self-knowledge and the honest confrontation of the contradictions in her character. Writing to a friend when she is enjoying the first flush of success in her Hollywood career, she describes her panic at not working for four months, which is two months too long. She is at home with Petter and Pia, but confesses, Only half of me is alive, the other half is packed away in a suitcase suffocating. What should I do? She has an affair with Robert Kappa, the war photographer, and her free spirit soars. She tries to be a good wife and to knit at home, but the siren call of something different propels her onwards. With Rossellini, it is his work she falls in love with first. She admires Rome, open city, and writes him a bold proposal. If you ever need a Swedish actor who speaks very good English and a little German, who can make herself understood in French and can only say ti amo in Italian, then I'll come and make a film with you. Years later, she explains his appeal more fully. It was a combination of passion that I fell in love with a man who was so different from any other man I had ever known, and it was my boredom in Hollywood. I wanted to do something that they didn't expect me to do. When her relationship with Rossellini broke down and she began to think about returning to Hollywood, she was still determined to do the kind of films I feel comfortable with. 
Success mattered greatly to Bergman, but not at any price. At the same time, though her children mattered to her intensely, she was prepared to leave them to pursue her career. Her priorities were not those expected. If you took acting away from me, I would stop breathing, she said. She admitted she had missed a lot by leaving not just one child, but her second set of children to be brought up mainly by others. I do regret it, but I don't think they suffered, she said. That complexity, the authentic voice of a woman who knew her own fallibility, of someone who loved and lost but never complained, makes Bergman, who died of cancer aged 67 in 1982, a peculiarly admirable Hollywood star. She was a pioneer before her time, protected and constrained by her loveliness. She voyaged ever onwards, brave and strong.